Welcome to our online Bible school. Today we're going to talk about one of the most controversial topics in Christianity today, and that is the rapture doctrine. Now, the rapture of the church is a fact. It is truth. The church of Jesus Christ will be raptured. You can count on that. And nobody really argues about that. Now, the problem arises when we start talking about the timing of this event. Because you've got about three different views on this, three different schools of interpretation. You've got the pre-tribulationists, which believe that the rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation. And you've got your mid-tribulation view, or pre-wrath, which is what it's basically called now. Um, the pre-wrath view has pretty much replaced the mid-trib view. Uh, but this view, anyway, uh, means that the church is going to get raptured after the tribulation, but before the wrath of God is poured out, which they believe happens towards the end of the tribulation. So, according to this view, Christians will go through the beginning part, and even some extreme persecution. But, when God's wrath is poured out against the wicked, they believe the church will be removed. Okay, and then you've got your post-trib view, which means the church will get raptured, after even the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth. So we're going to look at this and see if we can't discover what the Bible actually says about this future event. Because, as I'm going to prove, the Bible is very, very clear on this. There is no reason for there to be three different interpretations of this. So if we take off our religious blinders, if we remove those preconceived ideas that we tend to filter God's Word through, rather than the other way around. See, we should take our man-made traditions and doctrines and filter that through the Word of God, rather than taking those doctrines and having to make the Word of God fit it. Okay, so let's let the Bible speak on this and try to approach the subject like you've never heard of it before. Let's say this is the first time you've ever heard of the rapture. You don't know anything about the rapture. A approach it with that kind of attitude which means you're teachable, okay? And quit trying to insert what your church teaches on this. Let's just let the Bible do it. Okay, so before we get going here, let's look at the key passage that describes the rapture of the church. And it's taken from the letter to the Thessalonians from the Apostle Paul. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So we learn from this that the rapture of the church is when Jesus returns and gathers his people back to himself. It's that simple. Okay, so this passage, it says nothing about the timing of when this will happen. It mentions nothing about a tribulation. All it says is that when he comes back, we will gather back to him. And that's an important point I just made. Because it says in verse 15, the Lord's return. Now that's unmistakable. That can't be interpreted any other way. Paul is saying that when the Lord returns, which is one event, we're going to get raptured. We're going to gather back to him. Now, the reason I'm harping on this is because the pre-trib people are going to say, oh, no, no, Jesus comes in two phases. Now, listen to how confusing this one is. They say, oh, yeah, he comes back one time, but he comes back in two phases. What? How can he come back one time but come back in two phases? That doesn't even make sense. No, he comes back one time. It's called the Lord's return. Just like Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 
verse 15. And you would think that would settle the issue. It says the Lord's return. That's when we gather back to him. But no, we have to read into that, that that's two different phases separated by a seven-year period. Well, I just don't see that. But anyway, there's more to take from this passage that it kind of proves that we're actually talking about the return of the Lord, not some secret little come halfway in the sky and people disappear. No, this passage that Paul is talking about is talking about one event, the Lord's return. Okay, so let's look a little bit closer at what Paul mentions here and see if we can find some secret snatching away of the church. Okay, so point number one. Jesus is coming back with the Christians who have died. Okay, Paul's saying don't worry about those or don't weep for those who have uh, fallen asleep or have died. They're already with Jesus because he's bringing them with him at his return. Okay, so the passage also says Jesus is coming down out of heaven. He will give a commanding shout. An archangel will proclaim something. It says the voice of the archangel. And it mentions the trumpet call of God. Dead Christians' bodies will rise from the grave and reunite with their spirits. And Christians living will be caught up to the clouds to be with Christ. That's it. That's all we can get. Okay, so at this point, we cannot establish a pre-tribulation rapture, nor can we establish a pre-wrath or post-trib. Okay, this is all we've got. So let's be fair to the text. All right, let's not insert our own ideas into this passage because we can't do that. There's no tribulation mentioned, so we cannot form a doctrine just based on this passage. We have to go to other places in the Bible. But before we do that, let's just focus a little bit here on verse 16. Because these things that Paul mentions are mentioned in other places in the Bible, which is how you interpret Scripture. So, what did Paul mention? Well, the Lord himself will come down from heaven, commanding shout, archangels, the trumpet call of God. All things you would think would be very obvious to all people living on the earth. A very loud event. Yet, the pre-tribulation people say that this is a secret event and only Christians are raptured. I just want to ask them, well, how in the world, the trumpet call of God, how does, how does that sound and nobody hear it? Or the commanding shout of Jesus, how do people not hear that? Well, only the Christians hear that. Oh, well, that's very clever. That's, that's good of you to insert that in there. It doesn't say that. But you have to insert that in there if you stick to a pre-tribulation rapture scheme. You have no choice. You have to make this a private event to make it fit your pre-tribulation scheme. But the passage clearly teaches that this will be a loud public event. I mean, have you ever heard a trumpet blast? I mean, trust me, I used to be a high school band director and I taught marching band for years. And I've heard many loud trumpets. And let me tell you, they are blaring, piercing sounds. So, the trumpet call of God, again, how in the world is that going to be heard by just the Christians of the world? No, this is going to be a worldwide event. Everybody's going to see it and hear it. And I'm going to prove it to you. So first of all, the fact that when Jesus comes back, we're going to hear a trumpet blast should not be a surprise to any student of the Bible because you can look in the Old Testament and see that even then when God showed up, there was a trumpet blast. For example, when God was leading the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, he came down on Mount Sinai and there was lightning and there was smoke and the whole mountain quaked because of the glory of the Lord descending on that mountain. But let's look at a passage from the book of Exodus and see what happens when God comes down. Exodus 19. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. See, there's the trumpet. Everyone in the camp trembled. Now, did you notice how everyone in the camp noticed it? Not just, you know, the elite 
not just the special ones, not just the chosen ones of Israel, but everyone heard this trumpet. How could they not, right? God is coming down. Verse 17, Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. So here we see in the Old Testament a picture of God coming down out of heaven. You've got the clouds, you've got the earthquake, and you've got the trumpet blast. Does this not sound like what Paul mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Does this not sound like what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24? Yes. See, the Bible is very consistent, and God is very consistent. He came down in the Old Testament, trumpet blast, earthquake, everybody trembled. He's going to come back in the future, a very similar appearance. Except he's not going to hold back any of his glory. When Jesus comes back, he is coming back in the fullness of his glory. And the universe is going to erupt in flames. It says the elements will melt with fervent heat. He's not holding back this time. But I wanted to show you how consistent the Bible is, how consistent God is. Now, notice the whole nation of Israel trembled and heard this trumpet. They saw this. Again, it was not a secret event. So the, the passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, how can we interpret that as some secretive event? It has always perplexed me how some people come to the pre-trib rapture viewpoint. And I have tried many times to get inside the head of someone who believes in this. I've, I've heard their arguments. I've read their books. I've heard it from every angle. I've even tried to convince myself that I'm probably just not seeing it right. I must be wrong if everybody else sees this and I don't. I've tried to approach it from a fresh perspective like, okay, I've been missing something here, so I'm going to get it this time. But even with that attitude, I still come to the same conclusion. And the more I study this, the more I just cannot believe in a pre-trib rapture. I just can't do it. And I'm going to show you why. I just, I can't bring myself to that point. So I'm going to go through several of the arguments that they use to support the pre-trib rapture, and I'm going to unravel them for you. If you ever get into a debate with a pre-trib person, you're going to always hear this one brought up, that we're not appointed to the wrath of God. And here's the passage where they get that concept. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice how Paul contrasts the wrath of God with the salvation of God. So in other words, if you don't get saved, then you experience the wrath of God. If you do get saved, you can't experience the wrath of God. As John writes here, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. And from Romans, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? Here's another passage they use. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now I want you to notice something from this passage. Did you notice that Paul says that we're rescued from the wrath of God when Jesus comes back? Look at that again. It says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Okay, wait for his Son from heaven. So he's going to come back from heaven, going to come down in the clouds, and at that moment, He's going to rescue us from the wrath of God. The question is, is that the tribulation? Is the wrath of God the tribulation? Well, according to the pre-tribulation people, it is. Because, see, they claim that the church gets raptured before the tribulation. And when you ask them to document this fact from the Bible, they always show you the scriptures that I just went through talking about how we're saved from the wrath of God. 
So obviously the tribulation to them is the wrath of God. But if I can show you from the Bible that they are not the same thing, then you may want to re-examine your pre-tribulation rapture doctrine view. I'm just saying. One thing you may find rather interesting is a passage from the book of Thessalonians where Paul talks about Jesus coming back and rewarding those who were faithful and punishing those who weren't, but it all happening at the same time. So in other words, Jesus is going to pour out his wrath when he comes back, as we clearly saw from other passages. And we also know that that wrath is not going to be poured out on those who believe in him. So let's look at this next passage and see if the wrath of God is poured out on the righteous and the wicked. When the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels. And that's just exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He's going to come in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who is he bringing judgment on? Is he bringing it on the church? No. Those who refuse to obey the gospel. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, so what are we talking about here? The day he returns, obviously. He will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe, and this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him. So we just saw several passages of scripture that prove the wrath of God is not directed toward the church. The sons of God have nothing to worry about. No, we documented thoroughly that the wrath of God will be poured out on the wicked, on those who are outside of Christ. So when pre-tribulation people say that the wrath of God is not poured out on the church, you can say, I absolutely agree with you. You are 100% accurate because the Bible does teach that. But where they go wrong is they insert this idea that the wrath of God equals the tribulation. And that just simply cannot be, as I'm going to show you. So yeah, we are saved from God's wrath. But the question is, when is God's wrath poured out? Well, we just read that. It says, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment. Okay, that's exactly what Paul wrote in this previous letter. See, this is 2 Thessalonians. All right, but if you back up and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is what we started this video with, he's talking about this very thing, which is Jesus coming from heaven. So the passage from his first letter that pre-tribulation people like to use so much to prove this secret catching away of the church, well, if you put it all in context, there's just no room for that. Paul is saying here that when Jesus comes back from heaven, when he appears from heaven, which is the same terminology he used in the first letter, well, you can't, there's no room here for some secret rapture. Paul is talking about one event, the return of Jesus Christ. And there's no room for some secret one to come seven years prior to that. So, what other passages are there that might tell us when the wrath of God is poured out? Well, here's one from the Old Testament. Zephaniah the prophet wrote, the great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. Okay, here are the key points of what Zephaniah mentions. First of all, he says this is the day of the Lord. Okay, so that forever settles when this is. This is the day of the Lord. That is a future day when Jesus returns. Now, I know there are certain passages in the Old Testament that talk about the day of the Lord as being a political disaster or God sending a foreign nation against Israel to judge them because of their rebellious sin. But all of those were still looking forward to to the day of the Lord. All of those were just examples or foreshadowings of what was to come. So Zephaniah here is talking about that future day when the Lord comes back. 
But then notice he also mentions this as the day of wrath. So right there, that helps us make a connection between the day of wrath and the day of the Lord. So the day of wrath, or when God pours out his wrath, is the day of the Lord. Okay, so notice also that Zephaniah talks about this being a day of distress and anguish, which is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He's, he talks about trouble and ruin. Again, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Jesus mentioned all of this. Darkness and gloom. Again, Jesus mentioned the darkness, the sun not giving its light, the moon turning to blood, the clouds and the blackness, Jesus coming in the clouds, and the darkness in the sky, all mentioned by Jesus. The trumpet, again, mentioned by Jesus and Paul in the book of Thessalonians. But the main point that I want you to take from this is that the day of the Lord and the day of wrath are the same thing. God's wrath is reserved for that day that he returns. So the wrath of God cannot be the tribulation which supposedly takes place seven years before the day of the Lord. So the pre-tribbers can no longer say that the tribulation is the wrath of God. Here's a passage from the book of Revelation that documents that fact. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into the great winepress of God's wrath. The grapes were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. So how do we know, though, that this passage is about the day of the Lord when Jesus returns? Well, let's look at the preceding verses leading up to this to put it in context. John wrote, Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, Swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come. The crop on earth is ripe. So the one sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the whole earth was harvested. Now we know from Jesus' explanation of one of his parables that this harvest is actually the end of the world, or when he returns. Look what he said in Matthew. Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels. Does that not sound like Revelation 14? I believe it does. But Jesus isn't done yet. Let's read on. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will remove from His kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Okay, so let's recap what we have said up to this point. The wrath of God is not for God's children. We thoroughly documented that. We just saw that the day of wrath happens on the day of the Lord. We read that in Zephaniah. And the day of wrath comes at the harvest of the earth, which we read in Revelation 14. And then we know Revelation 14 has to do with the end of the world, or when Jesus comes back, based on the explanation of his parable. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to pour out his wrath on the wicked. But before God pours out his wrath, the earth is going to experience what is called the wrath of Satan. And this is what's called the tribulation. The tribulation is the result of the persecution that is brought on by the world, which is under the influence of the God of this world, Satan. So here's Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And then look at Revelation 13. They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Notice they use the word fight. Obviously he's being aggressive. Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority 
to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. So there, not only is he waging war, but he's overcoming and conquering them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. So we see here extreme persecution, extreme tribulation. But is it brought on by God? No, it's brought on by the beast, the Antichrist system. And it's directed towards God's holy people, which are Christians. So that shows you right there that they're here during all of this. One of the reasons I believe the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan are two totally different time periods is based on the fact that during the reign of the Antichrist and during the tribulation, the Antichrist will be exalted. He will exalt himself. Mankind will be exalted, not God. But during the day of the Lord, the wrath of God, when it's poured out, it says that only the Lord will be exalted in that day. So we're talking about two totally different days. So again, what is the point? The point is, the wrath of God and the wrath of Satan are two totally different things. So the pre-tribbers cannot say anymore that the church doesn't go through the tribulation because we're not appointed to wrath. They can no longer make the tribulation the wrath of God. They're two different things. So here's Isaiah talking about the Lord being exalted on that day. Isaiah 2 verse 12, the Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and lofty. What do you think the Antichrist would be included in that? He's proud and lofty, exalts himself above everything that is called God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Yes. So, going on, for all that is exalted and they will be humbled, verse 17, the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. So in contrast to that day when the Lord comes back, look at what Daniel said about the Antichrist. The king, meaning the Antichrist, will do as he pleases, exalting himself, not God, and claiming to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. He will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed. Again, that's the wrath of Satan the wrath of the Antichrist. For what has been determined will surely take place. And here is Paul reiterating this same truth. For that day will not come, and he's talking about the day that we gather back to Christ, if you start in verse 1. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. So what's the point? The point is that as long as the Antichrist is on this earth doing what he's going to do, the day of wrath has not come. Because it says in that day, only the Lord will be exalted. God is not going to share his glory with the Antichrist. You can believe that. So as long as the Antichrist is exalting himself, guess what? The day of wrath has not come. And since the Bible only promises us salvation from the wrath of God, it seems so far it looks like the church is going to be present during the tribulation. But there is way much more evidence for this. I mean, that's probably the weakest argument I have. You know, and I decided to go with that one first. So if I don't have you convinced yet, well, just hang on. Because I have a lot more to go over. So to further prove the point that the wrath of God cannot be the tribulation or persecution or any of that stuff, look at Acts 14.22. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. But notice what they didn't say. They did not say that you're going to get raptured before the tribulation. They did not say that your life is going to be so wonderful and great because you're a Christian. No, it says we're going to go through hardships. Actually, it says many hardships. 
And here's 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorifying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Again, he didn't say joyful in all of our wonderful living, all of our wonderful blessings and our rosy life. No, all of our tribulation. And I could go on with more, but the point is, the tribulation that we're obviously going to be a part of is not the same thing as the wrath of God, which clearly is not directed toward the children of God. If you went through all of this video up to this point, then you know we documented beyond any doubt that the wrath of God is on those who are not saved. On the other hand, the Bible also teaches that the church will go through tribulation, that we will go through persecution. So if we're not appointed to wrath, if we're not going to experience the wrath, and we are going to experience tribulation, well, you can only come to one conclusion. They're just not the same thing. You know, no matter how you twist it, you just can't cram, you know, a square peg into a round hole. So sometimes you just need to quit being so stubborn and let the Word of God speak for itself. And quit twisting and doing all these acrobats, try, you know, trying to get the Word of God to teach something it doesn't say. So let's just leave that there and let's go on to the next point. So here is Matthew 24, the famous Olivet Discourse where Jesus gave a sermon about the end times. The disciples asked him, what should we look for? What sign should we look for that tells us you're coming soon? And he gave a very lengthy answer, and it was very detailed. And right there in the middle of it, this is what he said. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, first of all, notice it says, after the tribulation. You would think that would settle the issue, but unfortunately... That makes it complicated for some. But anyway, it says, The sun will be darkened. Now, again, this is after the tribulation. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the celestial powers will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet. Does that sound familiar? Remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? The trumpet call of God? Remember the angels? The archangel? Well, let's see here. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now, unless you've been polluted with the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, you would immediately say that that's the same thing Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It would take you going to seminary and some scholar teaching you something that's not in the Bible for you to come to the conclusion that they're two different things. There's no way to say that what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24 is different from what Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. I mean, come on. They're clearly talking about the same thing. But yet the pre-trip people, they'll say, oh, no, no, no. See, you've got to understand dispensationalism. This is to the Jews. This is to Israel only. Jesus was not talking to the church. Really? It's, it's why are you so desperately trying to hold on to this pre-trip rapture doctrine? You just have to keep inserting more and more into the word of God to hold on to this non-biblical theory. Just let the Word of God say what it naturally says and just have faith in that. But no, we got to come up with this, you know, well, you got to understand the Feasts of Israel, the Feast of Trumpets, and you got to count these, what? Come on. I mean, if you've got to do all of that to come up with some doctrine, then maybe you don't have a good solid doctrine. Because God is very, very clear. He communicates clearly. If it's something important, He doesn't communicate it in riddles. He always just comes out and says what he means. So if, if the pre-tribulation rapture is true, don't you think God, Jesus, or Paul, or somebody would have come out and just said it? Rather than having to make you go on some scavenger hunt, trying to piece all of these puzzles together? No, Jesus would have said it, Paul would have said it clearly, that, church, you're not going to go through the tribulation. 
So the fact that there's nowhere in the Bible that that is mentioned, and the fact that you've got a, you know, like I said, a scavenger hunt and piece, take this piece here and take that piece there and then come up with some elaborate scheme, that should raise a red flag. Okay? So I'll just leave that there. Now, going back to what Jesus said, he was borrowing from the Old Testament. For example, look at Isaiah 13. Or see, the day of the Lord is coming, the terrible day of his fury and fierce anger. The land will be made desolate, and all the sinners destroyed with it. The heavens will be black above them. The stars will give no light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will provide no light. And then skipping to verse 13. For I will shake the heavens. The earth will move from its place when the Lord of heaven's armies displays his wrath in the day of his fierce anger. So let's do a comparison here. Isaiah 13 verses Matthew 24. Well, the sun is darkened. There's a match. Moon not shed its light. There's a match. Heavens shaken. There's a match. Well, do you think Jesus had this passage in mind when he gave the sermon on the Mount of Olives. It's pretty obvious. He's using the same terminology. So a safe interpretation here is that Jesus was talking about the day of the Lord. In other words, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the heavens will be shaken on the day of the Lord, which is when he returns in glory. Now the question is, does the rapture of the church take place seven years before his return in glory. Well, let's continue on and see if we can find the answer. There are other similarities between the famous rapture passage of 1 Thessalonians 4 and Jesus' sermon in Matthew 24. For example, both passages mention Jesus coming in the clouds. Both passages mention a trumpet. And there are angels in both. So again, Jesus is talking about the day of the Lord. And he uses very similar terminology that Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 4. The point is, how can 1 Thessalonians 4 be a secret event that takes place seven years before Jesus' glorious return? Well, it just simply cannot be. Because Paul was talking about the second advent. He was talking about the day of the Lord. Hence the mention of the archangel, the trumpet blast of God, the commanding shout of Jesus. This is not a secret rapture. This is a public, glorious return. Okay, I mentioned briefly the pre-tribulation argument of dispensationalism that in Matthew 24, Jesus was talking specifically to the Jewish people. He was not addressing the church. Because they say, you know, when the angels gather the elect from the four winds, he was talking about the Jewish elect, the elect of Israel. Well, let's take a look at that. Romans 8.33 Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Paul's talking to Christians there. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Again, talking to Christians. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. So again, the elect have been sanctified through the Spirit, are obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. How can that be the Jewish people? They are not obedient to Jesus Christ. They have not been sprinkled with his blood. They do not believe that he's the Messiah. So the elect of God are Christians. They are born again children of God. So let's read this passage again. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect, which we just documented are Christians, from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. So there is only one time when Jesus raptures his church, and it's at the end 
of the tribulation. It's at this moment when he comes in power and great glory. But, you know, some pre tribber will say, oh, no, no, notice there it says, from one end of the sky to the other, or one end of the heavens to the other, as another translation says. So they go, see, see, it's not on the earth, it's in the sky. Just like 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, we're going to meet him in the clouds. See here, it says, from one end of the sky to the other. Well, yes, it does say that. But did you know that Matthew was not the only gospel written? Did you know that Mark talked about this? Luke talked about this? So if we go to what they wrote, maybe we can get a more complete picture of what Jesus said. Hence the reason there were four gospels instead of one gospel. So here's how Mark recorded the words of Jesus. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect, there's that word again, the elect, from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So here, Mark includes earth, not just heavens, like in Matthew. So you cannot argue that in Matthew, see, it's gathering everybody in the sky, so this must be the pre-trib rapture. No, because Mark gives us a more complete picture here. So that's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, so there's another argument that you'll probably run across if you debate a pre-tribber. They always talk about Revelation 4.1, where John is taken to heaven in the spirit and shown visions of the future. And believe it or not, they're going to say, this represents the rapture of the church. And keep in mind also, this is the same group who claims to adhere to a very strict literal interpretation of the Bible. Yet, for some reason, the Apostle John symbolically represents the whole church. So, how can you claim to be a literal interpreter and then all of a sudden John represents the whole church? So, you need to be consistent with your methods of interpretation. But anyway, the argument goes like this. The church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 4. So, you've got the first three chapters of Revelation seven churches are addressed. And then all of a sudden, the church is never mentioned again. So to the pre tribber this means the church must be raptured. And I'm just like, really? I mean, you're going to base a doctrine on that? Where it doesn't even come out and say it plainly? You're just uh, going on a suggestion or some kind of symbolic interpretation? I don't think that's a very safe way to interpret the Bible. And definitely not a good way to come up with a doctrine. So let's look at this verse from the Bible and see if we can find a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Then, as I, the church, looked, I, the church, saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here, church, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and the flesh, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Now, you noticed all the stuff that I added to that verse. But I did that to make a point because that's basically what a pre-tribulation person is saying when they interpret this verse. Because they think John, the speaker, the writer of this, represents the church. So I just thought I'd go ahead and just interpret it for you the way they do. But hopefully you saw how utterly ridiculous that was. Okay, obviously John does not represent the church. But the pre-trib people say, oh yeah, this represents the church because see, it says there, come up here. I'm again like, what? Yeah, God said, come up here to John because that God is up there. But that has nothing to do with the church. And then they'll say, yeah, but see there it says a trumpet blast. Like someone spoke to me like a trumpet blast. So see, there's, there's the trumpet of First Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, come on now. Did you read Revelation chapter 1? John heard a voice like a trumpet there too. So why was that not a rapture? How come all of a sudden the trumpet voice in chapter 4 is a rapture? Why can't you stick to a consistent hermeneutic to stay out of these problems? What John is trying to say in chapter 1 and chapter 4 is that the voice of the Lord Jesus is a piercing, powerful sound. So the trumpet voice in chapter 4 has nothing to do with the trumpet call of God that Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So again, 
John does not represent the whole church. When God says, come up here, he's not talking to the church. He's talking to one person. When John says he hears a voice like a trumpet blast, I don't know why people automatically make that the trumpet of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but it's a simile. He is saying the voice is like a trumpet blast. He didn't say it was a trumpet blast. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4 that when Jesus comes back, that there will be a trumpet call of God. Paul was not using a simile there. So again, consistency when you interpret the Bible. Okay, now all of those arguments were just a matter of interpretation. Yeah, I understand people can interpret the Bible in different ways. But this is the nail that is going to forever close this coffin. This idea that John represents the church and this is the rapture of the church. Well, the rapture as I understand it, and even the passage that pre-tribbers use from 1 Thessalonians 4 mention a physical resurrection from the dead. Notice I used the word physical. And remember when I read verse 1 of chapter 4, how I added all of those words just to try to make a point? How I said I was in the spirit and the flesh? Well, I, I did that for a reason. Because if John was in the spirit and John represents the rapture, well, what about the physical body that we're going to get at the rapture? How come John wasn't in the flesh? You see, if he's in the Spirit, that can't represent a physical resurrection, which is what the rapture is. So let's take some time here and let's examine the resurrection. And we'll even start with the famous rapture passage. And let's see if we can find here a physical resurrection. Verse 14, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, so what are we talking about here? When Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Of course, they're going to be coming back in their spirit going on. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, again, he's talking about when Jesus comes back, his return, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. See, so there you have it. That is a physical resurrection. Because what's in the grave? Is your spirit in the grave when you die? No. Your spirit goes back to be with the Lord. I mean, and you can do your own research on that. Okay, I'm not going to give you a million verses to prove that. But when you die, your spirit goes to be with the Lord, and your physical body goes into the dirt. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So this can't be a spiritual uh, resurrection from the graves. That is a physical resurrection. The spirit is what's going to come back with Jesus. Okay? All the saints that come back with him, they're going to be in their spirits. Okay, they're spirit bodies. But at the resurrection of the dead, the spirit and the flesh are going to be reunited. Just like what happened with Adam in the garden, when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That spirit animated that physical body. Well, at the resurrection, our spirit is going to animate our old dead bodies and they're going to come back to life. So, the point is, John being in the spirit being taken to heaven cannot represent the rapture because the rapture is a physical thing, not just spiritual. And here's a verse that documents that fact. Philippians 3, But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies, see there you go, our flesh, and change them into glorious bodies, like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Now, could that not be any clearer? That the resurrection is going to be a physical one. Weak mortal bodies changed into glorious bodies? You'd have to go to seminary to mess this one up. It's really that simple. Okay, but let's look at another verse from Romans 8. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, 
he will give life to your mortal bodies, that's the flesh, by this same spirit living within you. So obviously Paul is talking about the resurrection because he's talking about when God raised Jesus from the dead. Okay, so he's saying just like when God raised Jesus from the dead, he got a new spiritual body, his weak mortal body was changed, the same thing's going to happen to you when you're raised from the dead. And then Paul goes on later in verse 23 of the same chapter. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. And then lastly, here's this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Now, again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. You should, be, have, you should have an image of your mind now of bodies coming up out of the graves, being reunited with their spirits. All right, So that body that's planted in the ground when we die will be raised to live forever. Verse 43. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. So I ask you again, when is this going to happen? When is this resurrection going to take place? Well, just in case you didn't get it from the other verses, Paul's going to make it very clear. He continues on later in the chapter. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. And when will this transformation take place? Next verse. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, I now, again, where did we see a trumpet before? First Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. See how consistent this is. Okay, so for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. Does that sound familiar? Did we not read that in First Thessalonians 4? And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. But it happens at the last trumpet, when that trumpet sounds, which is the same trumpet that Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians 4. It is the same trumpet that Jesus talked about. So really all we have at this point is the simple fact that when Jesus comes back, he's taken his church. He's saving us from the wrath of God. Nowhere in all of the scriptures that we've gone over is there even a hint of some secret snatching away of the church seven years prior to his coming in glory. What we do have is a very consistent message. Jesus is coming back one time. And when he does, that is the resurrection. And there's only one resurrection. Everybody's raised at the same time, the good and the bad. So let's take some time and examine this. Here's a parable that Jesus gave, and we kind of touched on this earlier, but let's go into this a little further. Starting in verse 24 of chapter 13. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Now what did he just say? Let them both grow together until when? The rapture? No, 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 no. The harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds 
and the harvesters we know are the angels. Tie them into bundles and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. Okay, and now for the explanation. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. When? The rapture? No, the rapture is not the end of the world, according to the pre-trib people. Because remember, there's going to be a seven-year period of tribulation after the rapture. Well, no, Jesus is saying here that this will happen at the end of the world, which is obviously after the tribulation. Verse 41, the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. So, takeaway, the righteous and the wicked are gathered at the same time. It's not separated by seven years. So look at Acts 24, verse 15. I have the same hope in God that these men have, that he will raise both the righteous and the unrighteous. Again, it happens at the same time. The righteous are not raptured, and then seven years later, the unrighteous. Okay, here's another parable from Jesus. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. So, again, the good and the bad are all taken in at the same time. Continuing on, that is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus did not say, this is the way it will be at the rapture. The angels will come, and they're going to take the church, and they're going to leave the wicked people on the planet for seven years. That is not what he said. And here's another teaching of Jesus. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and will judge all people according to their deeds. And here we have a passage, again from Matthew, where Jesus talks about the resurrection, meaning one. Notice what he says. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Jesus did not say, at the two resurrections, the one that happens before the tribulation, which is the rapture, and then the one seven years later. No at the resurrection, like we just saw when everybody is gathered. And here's a passage from Matthew 24, the great Olivet Discourse. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. But notice how Jesus says, that when the lightning flashes in the east, it's visible in the west. That's what, it, what he's saying here is the lightning flashes, the light from that flash shines all the way to the west. And so it will be when the Son of Man comes. In other words, when he comes, everyone's going to see it. It's not going to be a secret. It's not going to be a private rapture. But see, the pre-tribbers, they're going to insist that this passage in Matthew is indeed the glorious appearing, which they place seven years after the rapture. So they're going to say, yeah, well, that's talking about Jesus' return. Well, yeah, but there's only one return. Why do you have two? Where in the Bible does it say he comes halfway and then seven years later comes back all the way? It just doesn't say that. And then the pre-tribbers, they'll come to this passage and they'll say, Oh yeah, yeah, look at this. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. And they say, see, yeah, one's taken, one's raptured. Verse 41, two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Of course, they insert the word rapture where it says taken. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. I've actually had people tell me this passage documents the pre-tribulation rapture. And I just want to ask people, do you not read the Bible in context? Have you not read the whole chapter? 
See, verses 39 and 41 are not verses 1 through 2. It's verse 39 through 41, which means there must be 38 verses before this to put it in context. So if you read this in context, Jesus has already talked about him coming in power and great glory. So this cannot be a pre-tribulation rapture, for goodness sake. Just read the whole passage. It just won't fit. And add to that the fact that in verse 39, he says, that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That is the coming of the Lord. How can that be him coming secretly, halfway in the sky, and then taking the Christians? It can't be that. Okay, the context will not allow for that. All right, and here's a passage that proves that. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory. Okay, now, so what are we talking about? Is it not obvious? And all the angels with Him. He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him. And He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So here you have the gathering of the righteous and the wicked at the same time. And what time are we talking about? When Jesus comes in his glory with his angels. The time when he sits on his glorious throne. And all these passages that we've talked about for this hour so far have only talked about one appearing. Nowhere has it even given a hint that he's going to come halfway and then seven years later come back all the way. No, every passage talks about him coming one time. And they're all consistent. They all mention the same thing, the trumpets and the angels and all this stuff. Okay, now here's a passage we've already gone over, but I think it bears repeating because it's going to document the idea that when God comes back, the righteous and the wicked are going to be involved. So let's read it. When the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from His glorious power. When He comes on that day, He will receive glory from His holy people, praise from all who believe, and this includes you, for you have believed what we told you about Him. So what do we have here? We have Him coming in flaming fire with His mighty angels, bringing judgment on those who don't know God, but at the same time, He's going to receive glory from His holy people, and praise from all who believe? So if all of this happens at the same time, where are we getting this pre-trib rapture idea? Okay, how are the righteous, uh, you know, being recognized here if they've already been gone for seven years? Okay, now that was 1 Thessalonians. Now look how consistent Paul is. Look what he puts in the second letter. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. Now, can we please all agree on the fact that when he comes to be glorified in his holy people, that that is the rapture of the church? That is when we receive our glorified bodies that we went over in detail? Okay, so on the day he comes to be glorified in his people, on the same day, people are going to be punished with everlasting destruction. So the pre-tribulation rapture view cannot be biblical because this just says that when he comes, the righteous and the wicked are going to be involved. The pre-tribulation rapture involves just the Christians. All right, anyway, let's continue on with this theme. But let's compare Revelation chapter 6 
with Luke 21. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth, as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll, being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Okay, here are some points you need to take away from this, because we're going to compare this passage to Luke 21. The earthquake, sun blackened or darkened. The moon is red, stars are falling, heaven recedes like a scroll, people are afraid, hiding in the mountains. Okay, and obviously it's talking about the return of Jesus Christ. It's the day of his wrath. So now let's look at Luke 21. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. All right, so here's some takeaway from this passage. Heavenly signs, the sun, moon, and stars. Well, we read about that in Revelation 6. People fainting from terror. Did the people in Revelation 6 not cry for the mountains and rocks to fall on them because they were afraid? Heavenly bodies are shaken. Revelation 6 mentions the stars falling from the sky like figs falling from a fig tree when shaken in a mighty wind. They're going to see the Son of Man. Well, the same thing in Revelation 6. They saw him and were terrified. They were so afraid they ran into the mountains saying, please collapse on me. Okay, and then here's a really important point. Jesus says that this is the redemption. What is redemption? Well, that's what we're looking forward to. The redemption of our bodies, our salvation that comes with Jesus. But here's another important point. Notice that on this day, at this time, the wicked are going to hide and the righteous are going to look up. Jesus said, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. But the wicked are going to be hiding. That's because they're both on the earth at the same time. Do you know why? Because the church was not raptured seven years prior to this event. Jesus clearly said that this is the redemption. So let's define what the redemption is. Here's a passage from Hebrews chapter 9. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. So what's he bringing when he comes? Salvation. But guess what else happens? Look here what Romans says. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Now surely we can all agree that the passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, where you know the dead bodies are coming out of the graves and being reunited with their spirits, obviously that is the redemption of our bodies. That is our salvation. But the important point is, is that Jesus places this at the end of all things. After the cosmic signs in the heavens that he talked about. After, not before. And what's the point? Well, the point is, Jesus is describing his second advent in Luke 21. He says he will come in power and great glory. And then he says, and when you see all these things that precede my return, look up. For you know your redemption is near. Okay, so he's linking his return, his second advent, with the redemption. So if that's true, then how could the church be raptured seven years prior? How could they be redeemed seven years before the glorious appearing? That's a contradiction that won't work. Now here's another common concept you're going to hear from the pre-trib people. This idea of imminence. They say, 
the rapture is imminent. It can happen at any moment. And they argue that the New Testament teaches that Jesus can come at any moment. It, like he comes like a thief in the night. And we need to watch. And nothing needs to happen before Jesus comes back. But that just simply is not true. And I can prove it from the Bible. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters. Okay, so what is the subject? Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's just talk about that. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the second advent. That is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. That is Matthew 24, 29 through 31. This is all the other passages we've been talking about. It's the coming of the Lord. And there's only one of those. And it's not a two-phase deal either. And don't let people tell you that, because that's not true. But Paul is talking about here the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and us being gathered to Him. Now, is that not a rapture? Yes. Paul says that's going to happen when He comes back. And the pre-trib people are going to say, well, yeah, when he comes back, we are going to get gathered to him. That's the rapture. And nothing needs to happen before that event. Oh, really? Okay, well, let's read the next verse. But let me read verse 1 to put it all in context. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, which is a rapture, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Wow, what is Paul talking about here? The day of the Lord. Which he just said in verse 1 is the day Jesus comes back and we gather back to him. Okay, going on. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, what day? The day he comes back and we gather to him. He says that day will not come until, uh-oh, now we got a problem here for the pre-trib people because they say that the day can come any moment. And Paul clearly says right there, that day that we gather back to Christ, remember verse 1, that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. How much clearer can this be? It's almost like God anticipated the pre-trib rapture doctrine, and he put this in place to specifically address that. Because it clearly says that we're not going to gather back to Christ until these things happen first. There's no wiggle room here. There's no getting out of this. If you sit there and you claim that there's a pre-trib rapture after reading that passage, then there's something wrong. You, you are stubbornly hanging on to it a doctrine that's not biblical. So the idea of imminence, this idea that Christ can come any moment, is not biblical. Based on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what we just read. But there's a lot more. For example, look at Joel chapter 2, starting in verse 30. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness. See, we've read that, what, a million times now? And the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, we have thoroughly documented the fact that when Jesus comes back in wrath, that is the day of the Lord. Okay, Paul said that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He goes, don't let anybody fool you into thinking that the day of the Lord has come. And then he equates that with the return of Jesus and our gathering back to him. Okay, so here Joel is saying, before that day, you're going to see all these signs in the heavens. So that obviously means that the church cannot get raptured in any moment. Because this has to happen first. And according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2, two things have to happen first. The falling away and the son of perdition being revealed, who is the Antichrist. Until that happens, we're not going anywhere. Look what the prophet Malachi said about it. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. 
That's very clear. So now we have a third thing. In addition to the falling away, the apostasy, and the appearance of the Antichrist, and all the signs, and the, you know, the, the sun being darkened and the moon turning to blood before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, now here we've got Elijah the prophet being sent before the day of the Lord. So the church is not going to go anywhere until this happens. And you're still going to have the stubborn pre-trib people say, well, the day of the Lord, that comes seven years after the rapture. But if I can prove that what Paul was talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, was indeed the glorious return of Jesus Christ, the second advent, then the pre-tribulation rapture has to be discarded because that's really the only passage that might even give a hint of this so-called secret snatching away of the church. Okay, but I'm going to prove to you that that is not at all what Paul was talking about. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to read that passage again, but we're going to read on into chapter 5 and see that Paul was indeed talking about the day of the Lord. Because he said the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night, and he did not change subjects midstream. Remember, Paul didn't write his letters in chapter and verse. So there was no chapter 4 and chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. He was continuing a thought. He was writing a letter. So when he talks about the day of the Lord in chapter 5, he was talking about the day of the Lord in chapter 4. But even more than that, he mentioned it in the first chapter. Here's what he said. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. So what's he talking about there? When Jesus comes back, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. So he equates him coming back from heaven with us being rescued from the wrath of God. Now, he's not talking about a pre-tribulation rapture here. He's talking about what he always talks about, the glorious appearing of Christ. I'll prove it to you. Let's keep going. Here's what he said in the second chapter. For what is our hope? our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. Is it not you indeed? You are our glory and joy. So again, Paul, he only mentions one return. He never talks about two different phases of the return of Christ. He always talks about one. And here's what he wrote in the third chapter. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Again, he only talks about one return. There's not a two-phase scheme here. And then we come to the famous rapture passage of chapter 4. And you would think that Paul would be continuing the thought from the first, second, and third chapter, right? But oh no, the pre-tribbers have to insert this new idea, this secret snatching away of the church, which is not even there. So let's read it. In context. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns... Now, what has Paul been talking about for three chapters? The return of Christ. So why would you want to insert a new idea here, foreign to this passage? He's talking about when Jesus returns. He's not talking about a secret halfway return. When he returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, when the Lord returns. Again, I have to emphasize what he's talking about. When the Lord returns. He's being consistent here. He's not introducing a new concept. When the Lord returns, we'll not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So there's really nothing new here. This is the exact same thing that Paul talked about in every other place in the New Testament that he wrote about this. This matches up perfectly with what Jesus taught 
the Old Testament prophets. Yet the pre-tribbers have to insert a new concept here that's not even written. They'll say, no, this is not the day of the Lord. This is something that takes place seven years before the day of the Lord. Well, not so fast there, Slick, because you got to read the fifth chapter in context. So let's do that. Now remember, Paul wasn't writing in chapter and verse. He wasn't thinking, oh no, this is now the fifth chapter of my letter. Let me change the subject real quick. No, he's continuing the thought. We're being caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord. But what is this? Well, let's see. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Okay, is it not clear what Paul's talking about? The day of the Lord? So all that stuff he just mentioned in the previous chapter about getting snatched up to the clouds and the trumpet blast, how in the world can that be a secret? Rapture. No, it is the day of the Lord. It is the second advent. It is the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so let's briefly go through some more arguments that pre-trib people use. And here's a very common one you're always going to hear brought up. From the book of Revelation, where Jesus tells one of the churches that they're going to be kept from the hour of trial. And of course, the hour of trial to them means the tribulation. So here's the actual passage from Revelation 3.10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So first of all, the Greek word that is used for keep is terio. It means to attend to carefully, take care of, to guard, metaphorically to keep one in the state in which he is, to observe, to reserve, to undergo something. It in no way means take out of. It actually means to protect, to guard. A perfect example of this can be seen in the book of Exodus, where God is pouring out his wrath on the Egyptians, but the Israelites are spared. Okay? The Israelites were not raptured. They were not out of the land of Egypt. They were right there in the middle of it. But they were spared. God can do the same for us. Now here's another thing to think about. Jesus was talking to this church in the first century. And he promised them that they would be kept from the hour of trial. So how could he have been talking about the tribulation or the wrath of God that's going to be poured out 2,000 years later? No, he promised this first century church that they would be spared. And another thing, why is it that they are the only church that's promised this? So, you know, you got to consider that maybe that's not even what Jesus was talking about in the first place. Well, anyway, that's going to conclude our study on the rapture. I hope that this has blessed you. I hope you learned something. And I hope it has given you a better picture of how this age is going to end. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. I believe the church is about to face some serious tribulation. But don't worry. We have been promised that we will not face the wrath of God. And that, my friend, is what you should be afraid of. The wrath of Satan, Jesus said, don't worry about it. I have overcome the world. And he says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we can do it. We can get through this. But we will not face the wrath of God. You can count on that. But you better be careful with the pre-trib idea because if I'm right... If the false Christ comes first and you're expecting Jesus at any moment, you might get deceived. But let me tell you a secret. I call it the pinch test. Because if you remember, we read all these passages about what happens when Jesus comes back. How our bodies are changed instantly, the redemption of our bodies, we get our new spiritual bodies. So as long as you can pinch your flesh body, that means that the true Christ the real Jesus has not appeared. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. And I pray that this has blessed you. And I appreciate you taking the time to watch this YouTube video. I'll see you in the next video.